Praise the Lord. Lord, as we lift up your name, as our praises go up, Lord, send down your blessings on your people, Lord. We're here to be blessed by you, Lord, and to be filled with the knowledge of you and your presence. So, Lord, we just worship you. We give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. And as you grab your seats, you can grab your Bible and turn with me to the book of Hebrews. We are in our series, Big God, Big Picture, taking an overview of the book, well, all of the books of the Bible, and tonight we are in Hebrews. Um, for those of you who maybe have tried uh, reading through the Bible, you know that, well, if you start in Genesis, it's a good book. And then you get over to Exodus, and it starts off really good, and you pass 2021, and it's like, oh boy, it gets a little bit more difficult. And then you get to Leviticus, <laughs> and that's where your New Year's resolution falls apart. Leviticus is a difficult book, and so is Hebrews. You, you see, Hebrew in the New Testament is like Leviticus in the Old Testament. But you see, if you get to understand this book, just like you, if you get to understand Leviticus, you will fall in love with those books because they're the richest, some of the richest writings in all of the Bible. And I believe Hebrews and Leviticus almost go hand in hand as they, well, when you look at Leviticus, it, it gives you a picture of what's to come. Who's to come? Jesus Christ. He is the sacrificial lamb that will take away the sins of the world. And that will be part of the argument that the writer of Hebrew will give in this lesson. And so, if you will join me, just ask the Lord to, again to bless our time. Lord, this is your word. We believe every part of it. Every word is inspired by you and by your Holy Spirit. So, Lord, we open our eyes, our hearts to you, Lord, uh, and help us to just see the Christ that is being proclaimed in your word. Lord, that we may become like him. Lord, that we may be changed and transformed. Lord, we ask these things again in Jesus' name. Amen. The book of Hebrews well, who wrote it? Well, some people will say, well, it's most likely Paul. And others will say, well, it's probably Barnabas or Barney. <laughs> or some will say that it's even Apollos. And people have different reasons why. Because this book, it, unlike the other letters that we have in the New Testament, they don't open with, like we have Paul to the Colossians, you know. Uh, this book does not have... Uh, one of those openings. And so people are speculating who they think this author might be, and we could be right or we could be wrong. I tend to lean that, uh, to believe that it's none other than the Apostle Paul because of what we see in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 23, where the writer says, Know that our brother Timothy has been set free with whom... I, 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 shall, uh, I shall see you if he comes shortly. And we know that Timothy was Paul's, uh, you know, right-hand man. He was his son in the faith. And so uh, I believe this is the reason why uh, this is uh, none other than Paul's letter. But I could be wrong. We will get to heaven and, and find out the truth. But this was written to the Hebrews, the Jewish Christians. You see, just like in every age, every generation, there's always going to be those who will say, hey, Jesus is not enough. You need to go back to the law. You need to go back to the prophets. You need to go back on the bondage. And so the writer is going to address these Hebrew Christians and try to encourage them and show them what they have in Christ but his purpose is to warn, to warn them, 
that if they go back, if they try to add the law, if they try to go back to the priesthood and all of those things that we see in the Old Testament, well, if they try to go back, they're actually detracting from what Christ has done and who he is. And so the theme of this really, if I can put it in the simplest form, is that Jesus is better. That's the summary of this book. Jesus is better. As we will see that he, he provides, well, he's more superior. He's better than the prophets. He is better than, uh, than the angels. He's better than Moses. He's better than Aaron and the priesthood. He is better. He's far superior than anyone else. And he's not even to be compared. And so the writer will go through in the first seven chapters and tell us why Jesus is better than all of these folks. <laughs> but also, secondly, he's going to talk about how Jesus provides a better covenant. We know that there are several covenants throughout the Bible, but there are two major covenants. It's the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. Pretty simple. Uh, you can even say the Old Testament, right? And the New Testament. And so the Old Covenant is based on the, pro or the, the, the agreement that God made with Moses and the Israelites. And then you have the New uh, Covenant, which is based on, as we will see, based on a promise that Jesus Christ, if you just believe on him and what he has done, uh, you will be saved. And so he's going to talk about this new covenant. And then the third section of this book is uh, how do we live in light of these truths? How do you live? All right, we know that Jesus is better. We know he have a better covenant. But now that we know the truth, how do we live? And so he's going to take us through these three different divisions of this book. So let's start off with the first division. The first section, chapters 1 through 7, the superiority of Christ to leading figures in the Bible. How is Jesus different from everyone else? Well, first of all, he opens up with these words in chapter 1, verse 1, and to God, who at, all, at various times and in various ways spoke to, excuse me, spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his son. The first thing I want to point out here is that the writer is saying that Jesus is better than the prophets. Now, if you think about the prophets of the Old Testament, these guys were, they were amazing. You know, you look at Elijah and the faith that he had and the miracles that he did. You look at Moses, you look at uh, Isaiah and Jeremiah, the things that uh, God revealed to them. But the writer here is saying that, that God used in various times and in various ways. We know that he spoke to Moses, what, through a burning bush. He spoke through Elijah through a sm still small voice. Uh, he spoke to Balaam through, listen, a donkey. <laughs> and, you know, if you can think about it in this way, while... That was impressive. While they were able to pen for us uh, these truths from the way that God gave it to them, uh, you know, whenever you have, if I can use it this way, remember when you were probably in elementary school and the teacher will do that little project, they will say, okay, I'm going to whisper a secret into this person's ears and I want you to share it down the road. And by the time it gets to the last person, it's like it's a whole different <laughs> Uh, you know, thing there, right? And so there's, there's always that chance of us misunderstanding God. Um, and so what God is saying here, what the writer is saying, that in times past, God spoke to us in various ways in various, uh, through, uh, through different people. But the best way, listen, is to hear it directly from God. And so he is sharing that Jesus is, look at what it says, that in the last day he's spoken to us by his son. Now, when we say that Jesus is the son of God, uh, people think that, well, that, you know, God the Father and he had a son and, and so he gave birth to this son or something like that. But this term, son of God, it just simply means that it's, uh, he, Jesus is a, of the same nature. 
You know, I don't know if you know this, but I have, I actually have five children. I have Hannah, I have Micah, I have Kitty, I have Bunny, and Piggy. You say, oh, Alan, you have some pets? That's your children? Well, Gigi say, go talk to your daddy. Go, go get away, right? She's talking to the cat. Now, we know that the cat is not really my child, but it's part of the family. But in a sense, you, that, that cat, that, that guinea pig, that rabbit, they're not of the same nature as me. You see, God is saying that Jesus is of the same nature. And so in, in times past, in various ways, he spoke to us through the prophets in different ways. But in these days, listen, he speaks to us directly face to face through his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus made it possible because before Jesus came, God was this, this distant, uh, scary person. When he spoke to them from Mount Sinai and they said, we, Moses, who are you? We want to speak to God ourselves. And so they came to Mount Sinai and said, oh, God said, OK, I'll, I'll speak to them. And when he started to speak and the thunders and the lightning started to, to roll, they were like, Moses, you be the man. Go speak to God. It's OK. You're, you're special, right? They weren't able to comprehend the God. And so what God did for us, and I love the way that John puts it in John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God in verse 14, and the Word became flesh. God put on flesh so that we can understand Him and relate to Him, hear Him, touch Him, as, as the Apostle John would say, you know, we, we handle Him, we heard Him, we touched Him, we seen Him with our own eyes. God in flesh. You see, we, don't, we, we often will take for granted what we have today, that God wants to speak to us. And we often will go and relate and say, well, let me, let me go to some place and hear a prophet speak. No, God wants to speak to us. We don't want to sit and listen as we open his word and say, okay, I read this, but God, speak to me. What do you want me to do with what you're saying here? And he will guide you, and you'll be amazed. You'll say, oh, God spoke to me. Yes, that's what he wants to do. Because he don't want to be limited by any other medium. As we have so many different mediums today, we have, we have internet, we have phones, we have Facebook and FaceTime and all of these things. And all of those things are limited, you know. But God wants a face-to-face -face with us. And that's why it's so important that we get up in the morning before we run out and do anything, that we sit with Jesus, God with us. And so he uh, talks about how Jesus is better than the prophets. And I think the main point that he will have us learn here is why go back to an inferior way of communication, All right? The second uh, point that he wants to make is in verses, uh, well, chapter 1, verse 5, all the way through chapter 2, verse 18. And in this section, he's going to show how Jesus is better than the angels. Look at chapter 1, verse 4. Having come so much better than the angels. He's basically saying that Jesus is better than the angels. Now, if you think about it, even today that you will have even like the Jehovah Witness that will say, Jesus is nothing more than an angel. He's the archangel Michael. Well, that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible says that he is better than the angel. And, and if you think about it, well, he gives five reasons in this section. In verses 5 through 7, first of all, he said that he is the son, that Jesus is the son of God. And listen, and angels, God the Father tells angels to worship him. Now, if you know anything about God, he says this, that I share my glory with no one. No one, no angel is he going to share his worship. And anytime you see a, an angel show up anywhere in the Bible, and, and they, he shows up, the angel shows up to someone, what do, what's the first thing that they do? They fall down and they start to worship. What does that angel say? No, 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 no. <laughs> I'm no different from you. Get up. Don't worship me. Worship him. Worship God. And here it is in Hebrews. The, the writer says, and he quotes scripture, 
that the, that the father says to the angels that they should worship the son. He's speaking to the son. He says, your throne, O God. And so Jesus is not just an angel. He's not an angel. He is God manifest in flesh. And the angels are to worship him and we are to worship him. But also, he, is, he said that he is Lord in verses 10 through 12. That he is Yahweh. He is Yahweh, who is the eternal creator. Who created this universe? Who created this world? Listen, God did. When you go back to Genesis chapter 1, it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But that word God is Elohim. And Elohim in the, in the Greek, excuse me, in the Hebrew, is plurality for gods, or I should say it's really saying gods. But we know that, you look at Deuteronomy 6 verse 4, it says that the Lord God is one. He's one God. But he takes on the form of three persons, and it's something I can't comprehend. But all throughout the Bible describes that well, when you look at the Father, He is the Creator, but the Bible also tells us in, that, like in Colossians chapter 1, that Jesus is the Creator, that he, all things were created by Him and for Him. Go back to Genesis chapter 1, it says that the Spirit of God hovered the face of the deep, and, and so we know that the Holy Spirit was also part of the creation. And so when you look at all the attributes of the Father, you can see that all of the attributes of the Son, He's eternal, He's omnipresent, He's, he's everywhere, He knows everything, He's all-powerful, right? And so the Father and the Son shares the same attributes. And so if, if the Father is eternal, check this out, if the Father is eternal and the Son is eternal, then they, that means that they're the same because there only can be one eternal being, and so Jesus is eternal, and the Father is eternal, and so that's what, uh, you know, the, the writer will tell us, that He is Lord. He is the eternal Creator. But also, in verse 13, that He is sovereign. He is all-powerful. And listen, it says that He's seated on the right hand of God. He's seated on the throne. What does that mean? You see, Jesus is not in heaven, worried, oh my goodness, COVID, <laughs> Oh my goodness, the, 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 uh, you know, the elections, oh, he's not, no, he's seated. That means he's like, I know what's going to happen, I'm in control. There's nothing that happens in this world that, that Jesus doesn't know about and that he doesn't have a say in it. And so we can trust him. And so the writer again tells us that, that Jesus is better than the angels. He's not a created being, he is the creator and so the, the point here, I believe that the writer will want us to know is why worship an inferior being? Because there are people today that are worshiping angels. But we're not to worship anyone but God himself. Uh, the, uh, you know, well, let me just point out before I go to the next point that the objection is if Jesus is God, why did he come in human form? You see, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9 and 10 tells us, that he was made a little lower than the angels in order that he might suffer and die in order to, verse 10, bring many sons to glory and to be the captain of our salvation. Now, that's a fascinating section of scripture there, that Jesus was made a little less than the angels, being that he was almighty God. He took on flesh, became less than an angel so that he can be what? So that he can bring many sons to glory. You see, Jesus, I love to say it this way, became our big brother. If you know anything about the Hebrew Scriptures, Old Testament, if someone gets into debt, uh, and we see this, this play it out in the book of, of, um, of Ruth, where if you get into debt and you, you're losing your house, you're losing your land, you can have a kinsman redeemer where someone in the family that's, that doesn't have their own debt that they can afford to and they want to, they can pay for your debt and redeem you and re redeem the land and redeem your property and redeem the name. They can do so. And in order for God to redeem us, listen, he had to become one of us. You see, because that's the law. And, and God doesn't go against the law. He follows it. 
And so in order to redeem us, he couldn't send an angel. Why? Because the angel is not eternal. When we get born again, when we become born again, what do we inherit? We inherit eternal life. In order to inherit eternal life, you have to get it from an eternal being. An angel can't provide that. So Jesus, for a while, a temporary time, space, in, in, uh, time and space, he came, he became one of us to redeem us. Now, the third uh, point that the writer will have us to see tonight is that Jesus is better than Moses. In chapters 3, 1 through 6, uh, well, I'm not going to read it all, but in verse 3 and 4, it says, For this one, who is Jesus, has been counted worthy or more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house. For every house is built by someone, but he who builds all things is God. Now, if you know, again, anything about the Hebrew people, to say that anyone is greater than Moses is like saying, your mama, if I can say that. It's like insulting the Jewish people. It's, it's like cursing their mom, <laughs> right? And so the Hebrew, write, the Hebrew writer is saying that this Jesus is counted worthy more glory than Moses. Why? Because in as much as he who builds the house is more has more honor than the house. In other words, the Jews will say, look at Moses. Moses was the man. Listen, Moses built a tabernacle for God. He took this, the instructions from God. He took the wood and, and, and he structured it and he put the animal hide and, and put all of the elements inside of the tabernacle and God's glory came down from heaven and filled that place and wow! Moses was the man. But what the writer of Hebrews is saying, well, if you think about it, who gave Moses the wood? Who gave Moses the animal hide? Did he make the animal hide? Did he make the wood? Did, did he come up with the idea himself? No, who, who gave him all of that? It was God. And so God, listen, Moses is the builder, but God is the owner. <laughs> so the one who owns it all, the one who created this universe is greater. And so the writer of Hebrew is saying that Jesus, again, is God. Don't let anyone tell you that Jesus is less than God. And so it, it says in verse 4 that he is the builder of all things. See, the point here is why go to the builder when you can go to the owner? Jesus is the creator of this universe. So therefore, he is way superior than Moses. But I want you to note that Moses, the material that he used to build this tabernacle is dead wood, dead animals. All of these things didn't have any life in them. But the writer tells us in chapter 3, verse 6, it says, but Christ, as a son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast to the confession and the, and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. You see, Jesus, who is over the house, listen, what house? Not a dead tabernacle with dead wood and dead concrete and dead animal hide or whatever it is. Listen, the Bible tells us that we are the temple of God. We are the living stones. And when we hold fast, when we believe in Jesus Christ, he, takes his, he makes our heart his home. And so the tabernacle, if you go back to the tabernacle, when they, when they set it up, and it was a beautiful structure, but whenever they had to move, man, they had to put down all these thousands of pounds of all this wood, and they had to carry it across this desert. You know what happens today if, Jesus wants to move from here and go over somewhere else. I'll be back. <laughs> here he is. He's inside of me. Right? He's inside of you. Because why? We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are the temple of God. And so we are the living 
temple of God. Now, the fourth point that he wants to make in this, this book, in chapters 4 through 7, is that Jesus is better than Aaron, the high priest. You see, the responsibility of the high priest was to offer sacrifice. And again, I talked about Leviticus, and it's a bloody book because, man, there's all the sacrifice. You bring the bull, you cut it, you drain the blood, you take out all of the guts, and you burn it, and, and you bring the lamb, and, and it's just all of this blood, right? And all of this sacrifice. And the, the priest, that was their responsibility. But the Bible, uh, excuse me, the writer here tells us that Jesus is not just a regular high priest. He is the great high priest. He is the, 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 the one that's higher than all because of this simple truth. Look at chapter 4, verse 14 through 16. It says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. You know, as I'm reading this, uh, apart from my note, I, I, I'm just thinking of when I was growing up, I attended a, the Catholic church, and uh, I heard a lot of, you know, throughout the years, people complained and said, the priest don't understand what I'm going through. He's not married. He don't have any problem. He just stays in, a, in that, that room, and, and that's all he does, right? And, and so, you know, when you think about the responsibility of the priest, he was so busy meeting the needs of the people, he wasn't really living, <laughs> Right, But it doesn't, it doesn't mean that he doesn't have problems. And so we have the writer saying that we have a high priest who can sympathize with us because, you see, Jesus came, as it said, that he was tempted at all points. Every temptation that you and I could ever face in life, Jesus was, was faced with that temptation, but he didn't sin. He didn't give in to that sin. He didn't have that lustful eye. He didn't have that greed. He didn't have any of those things. He was able to overcome it so that he could be our great high priest who can sympathize with our weakness. You see, because when you and I fall, he can say, I understand what you're going through. I understand the suffering that you're going through. You see, Jesus suffered on that cross. He suffered probably more than any of us will ever suffer in our lifetime. And he did it all, not for his own sin, for, because he didn't have any sin. He did it for our, all of our sins. All of the sins of the world were placed on Jesus. And so we have this high priest that can sympathize with our weakness. And yet, again, he is without sins. You know, if you ever go to a doctor and you're going for maybe to check your heart, to check your blood pressure, your cholesterol... If you go there and you see that the doctor is overweight and he has high cholesterol and blood pressure and heart problems, and he's there saying, oh, I need to help you, you'll be like, no, 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 I need to help you. <laughs> Come on, let's go outside, let's get some exercise, let's change your diet. You're going to be helping him, and you will actually say, you know what, I think I need to find a new doctor. So here's the deal. The high priest... Old Testament, wonderful. They, great, they, did, they did great things. But you see, they had their own struggles. They had their own weaknesses. We're going to a high priest, Jesus, that have no weakness. And so if he's able to overcome, listen, he can give us the strength to overcome. And so the point, I believe, the point that the Hebrew writer would have us to know is that why go to a man, a priest, when you can go... Uh, directly to God, to Jesus, who is our great high priest. When he, as he was showed later on, that he didn't have to sacrifice for his own sins. And so the second section that we're going to look at now is chapters 8 through 10. And in these, this section is showing that how Jesus provides a better covenant. 
Now, as I mentioned earlier, that there are two major covenants, the new, excuse me, the old Mosaic covenants and the new covenants, which is of Christ. Look at chapter 8, verse 7 and 8. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. So the writer is arguing here that if the old covenant was good, then God wouldn't say, we need a new one. If you have a car and it's running good, there's no reason for you to say, I need a new one. But I tell you what, if it stops at the side of the road, you'd be like, yep, it's time for a new car, right? And, and everything, if, if, if it's working, if it's, if it's working good, then there's no reason to get a new one. But if it's not, then yeah, let's go shop, let's go car shopping. And so the writer is saying and pointing out that the old covenant, which is part of the Mosaic law, which is part of, well, is, is based on a condition. And if you remember, when the Israelites came to the foot of Sinai and God was making a covenant with them, and he said to them, if you keep all of these commandments, you'll be blessed. Blessed in the city, blessed in the streets. You'll be blessed everywhere you go. Your, your, your children you will be blessed. Your, 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 your livestock, your business, everything will be blessed. And the list of blessings was about this long. But then he says, but if you don't keep all my commandments, you're going to be cursed. And then all of the things that he said, the list that was this long, of blessings, he said, you're going to be cursed. But then it adds on a whole lot more, and that list is like, ay, ooh, that's a lot of curses. So the, the, the weakness of the old covenant, it was based on our ability to keep the, com the commandments, to keep the covenants. And so when the Bible said, thou shalt not kill, or murder, I should say, you say, well, I haven't murdered. Here's what Jesus said. Oh, yes, you have. you have. You have hatred towards your brother or your wife or your husband. Guess what? You have committed murder in your heart. You're guilty. So guess what? The curses. <laughs> Here comes the curses. Oh, that's too much. Thou shalt not steal. It was just one grape from Publix. You have stolen. <laughs> curses. Right? And so when you go through the law, you realize, man, I'm not doing too good. And so this is why the new covenant is so special, because it's not based on our performance. You see, the old, te the old covenant is saying, do, do, do. The new covenant says, done. What did Jesus say on the cross? It is finished. <laughs> I love that. Why? Because I don't have to try to perform to get to heaven. All I have to do is kick back, put my foot up on a lazy chair and believe that Jesus has done it and I'm saved. Done. Oh, how easy he have made it. And so it's based on a better promise is what the writer will say. The first co covenant, conditional. The second covenant, based on a promise. Look at verse 13. It says the new covenant has made the old obsolete. So here's the deal. Hebrew Christians, Hebrew Christians, why do you want to go back to the old? Why do you want to go back to under the law when Jesus has liberated you and all you have to do is believe that the work that he has done is sufficient? But he also points out that Jesus' covenant is better because he provides a better sanctuary. Again, in chapter 9, verses 1 through 28, we won't read it all. But you see, there are two sanctuaries. There's the earthly sanctuary. We see it in the, uh, in the tabernacle. We see it in the temple. But then there's the heavenly sanctuary. And the earthly sanctuary was inferior to the heavenly one because of the simple fact that it is, it is symbolic. It's a prototype 
of what Jesus was going to actually do in the heavenly sanctuary. So in other words, the priest will come in and he will take the, the cow or the ox or whatever, the bull, he will slaughter it, he will take the lamb, he will slaughter it, take the blood, sprinkle it on behalf of, of the people so that their sins could be cleansed. Well, let me put it this way. Did their sins really get cleansed? When you go to the store and you pick out whatever it is that you're going to buy, an outfit, the shoes, and you get to the cashier and then you say, they say, how are you going to pay? Cash or credit? I'll do credit. So you take out that credit card and you swipe it. Let me ask that question. Did you pay for it? No, you didn't. You did it on credit. You're going to have to pay for that down the road a month from now when the credit card bill comes in and you see it's $9,000 and you're like, what did I buy? Well, you got to take it back, right? <laughs> but you see, you did it on credit. And so what was going on in the Old Testament as these, the priests were sacrificing, what he was doing in a sense was cleansing their sins on credit, <laughs> Their sins didn't really get cleansed. It wasn't until Jesus should show up and sacrifice himself once and for all and finally pay for all of the debts of the past and all of our debts in the future. Jesus paid it all. And so the writer is saying that the heavenly sanctuary is better because, listen, the old one, symbolic, is a shadow is a prototype. The new one is where the actual cleansing took place. And Jesus provided for, for that, provided us with that. So the third point that he wants to make is that, the, that he provides a better sacrifice. In chapters 10, 1 through 18, uh, he, he gives that argument. You see, again, day after day, if you think about the priest in the sanctuary, in the tabernacle, he's offering sacrifice uh, at week, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, because every time he offers a sacrifice for my sins, guess what? Tomorrow I sin again. So I got to bring another lamb. Here comes the sacrifice and day after day. But Jesus sacrifice, he provides a better sacrifice because look at chapter 10, verse 14. It says, by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. I love that word. He has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. You see, Jesus shed his blood once for all. And the moment that he shed his blood, and I believe, listen, the Father looks at me and you just as if we were perfect. Just if I were perfect. He doesn't see all of my sins, all of my shortcomings, because he sees me through the blood of Christ, which is the perfect, sinless blood of our Savior. And so uh, the, the blood of these animals that were sacrificed uh, for, on behalf of the people, they were inferior. They just covered the sins until a later day. But Jesus' blood cleanses us. And makes us perfect. So now that we, uh, you know, look at all of these arguments that the writer is making, and he's basically saying, you know, these things are shadows. The old things are shadows. It's, it's like the virtual world that we live in. Uh, you know, we have gone so far with our computers and our smartphones you know in times past when you wanted to go on a roller coaster you actually went to the theme park and you got on the ride and you wee have fun today you strap something on your face a screen and and there you are in a virtual world it's not the reality it's fake we have virtual Bible studies nowadays. We have virtual meetings. We have virtual everything. And that's what the Old Testament was. It was the virtual. We have the reality today. The reality is Jesus and he is better. And so why settle for, 
something less? Why settle for something symbolic when you can re re uh, experience the reality is what the writer will tell us. Now, this leads us to the third and final section. We'll come to a close here. But how should we, re we live and uh, how should we respond in light of who Jesus is and what he provides? In chapter 10, verse 19 through 30, 39, he tells us that we should hold fast to our faith. To draw near to God and hold fast to our faith. You know, we don't need to offer sacrifice. Could you imagine living in the times of Old Testament and you, you want to spend time with God and you're like, man, I got I to gotta spend time with God. Let me go to the priest and bring my lamb. Man, you know, you bring in your lamb and here's my lamb priest. And can you go and sacrifice it? And I will lay my hands on it, transfer my sin. And you can go into the holies of holies and, and, and pray a prayer for me. And that was your, your experience. That was your, your ability to communicate with God. And you can only do it once a year. <laughs> and what does the writer of Hebrew tell us? We can boldly come to the throne room of grace. Listen, anytime, any place. You can be in your bathroom. You can be in your bedroom. You can be uh, on, in your car driving to work. It doesn't matter. Anytime, anywhere. We have this privilege of coming before our God. And Jesus made it possible. So the writer is telling us, hold, draw near to God. Just come near to him and hold fast to our faith. We don't need a sacrifice. We don't need a priest. A priest was a mediator. The Bible tells us there's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. We can go to God without a sacrifice, without a priest. We don't even need to go to a temple. And I'll even say this, you don't even need to go to church. You say, Alan, we don't need to come to church. Not to have a relationship with God. But actually, he will actually tell us in the same chapter, but do not forsake the gathering with the brethren. Why? Because you see, when we come together and we're stoking the fire of each other and praying for each other and, and encouraging one another, listen, it helps us to draw near to God. And I love the illustration. If you have a fireplace and it's burning with fire and the, the coal is in there and, and it's just this big fire and it's keeping everyone warm. And you take that one coal out of that fireplace and set it aside. What happens to that coal? It begins to die out. The fire still burns in the fireplace, but, but that coal dies out because, well, it's been removed. But you take that coal and put it back with the rest of the coal and whoo, there's fire again. How, how many believers have you seen just burn out because they have separated themselves from the church? And so we are told to do not forsake gathering with the brethren Draw near to God, hold fast to your faith, and then run the race of faith with endurance is what we are told in 11 and 12, in chapter 11 and 12. Chapter 11 gives us examples, and this is referred to as the faith chapter because it gives us uh, examples of those who live by faith. We have Noah. Think about Noah, a man of faith. God spoke to Noah and told him, Noah is going to reign. It's going to what? Yes, it's going to rain. What is rain? Before Noah's time, it never rained on the earth. It was this, this covering over the earth that kept it perfect. It was a perfect paradise in a sense. And so it didn't need to rain. And so because of man's sin, now God was going to judge the world. And he had that one word, go and build an ark. And for a hundred years, Noah was pounding away, building an ark. He never heard God's voice again. Listen, that's great faith. To do something, everybody's mocking him, but yet he believed God and he and his family, eight of them all, were saved. That's great faith. You see, Moses, uh, excuse me, Noah didn't go to a sanctuary. He didn't offer any sacrifice. He didn't have a priest. He was made righteous by simply believing what God said. You have, you have Noah, you have Abraham, same thing. Noah, uh, Abraham, I'm going to take you to a land 
uh, you know, your own country. I'll make you a father of nations. What? Hold on, hold on. I don't have any kids. I'm, you know, 75 years old. My wife is past childbearing age. What are you talking about? But Abraham believed, and guess what? At 99 years old, he had a child. He believed, and it says that God accounted it as righteousness. He didn't have any laws. He didn't have any sanctuary. He didn't have any sacrifice. He just simply believed the word of God. You have Rahab. You have Gideon, uh, that coward that was called a mighty man of God. You, you have Samson, who was strong, but yet he was weak. You have David. You see, you have all of these men. And how were they made righteous? By simply believing God. It wasn't any sanctuary. It wasn't any sacrifice. It wasn't any priest involved. So these people, they pleased God and were righteous, not by what they did, but what they believed. It's by faith. And that's why Hebrews 11, verse 6, I know some of you have memorized it, by, but without faith, it is impossible to please Him or to please God. For, we, for he who comes to God must believe that He is and that He is the reward of those who diligently seek Him. Just seek Him in faith, and guess what? He will give you all of those things that He's telling you about. Just believe, believe Him. And so, in chapters 13 through 25, I mean, excuse me, chapter 13, 1 through 25, he gives all, all different kinds of exhortations. You can read that. But again, just the summary of this whole book, <laughs> that Jesus is better. He's better than any prophet. He's better than any angel. He's better than any priest. He's better. His covenant is better. He's better than Moses. He's better than your husband. He's better than your wife. He's better than your children. He's better than your money. He's better than your car. He's better than your home. He is better. <laughs> and so therefore, why go back? Or even more, why settle for anything less than God's best? And so one of the things I didn't mention throughout this letter, the writer gives six warnings. And I'm just going to, Give them to you, and we'll close here. But he warns in chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, that we should not drift. If you think about being in a boat, if unless you're anchored, what's going to happen? You're going to drift. He says, do not drift, but he also, de do not depart. That we should not depart from the faith in chapter 3, verses 12 through 15. Do not depart from this knowledge of who Christ is. In chapter 4, verse 11 through 13, do not disobey. In chapter 5, 11 through, uh, chapter 5, 11 through 6, 6, he said, do not become dull. You know how easy it is to, to become dull. When we become a Christian, we become sharp because what? We're in God's word and we're learning and we're, we're talking to each other, encourage one another, you know, as iron sharpens iron. But over time, we become dull. We're, we don't have that sharpness anymore. And I, 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 I'm, I'm praying that every one of us just continue to be sharp in the Lord. But and he also warns that we are not to, uh, he warns against despising, you know, God. And then he also warns about, uh, excuse me, that's chapter 10, verses 26 to 39. And then lastly, chapter 12, verses 25 to 29 he warns against defying. So six warnings. We know who Jesus is. We know that he's better. But man, be careful. Don't drift. Don't turn back. Jesus is what you need. And I find that sometimes, oftentimes, we don't realize that Jesus is all we need until he's all we have. When everything has been stripped away and we realize, wow, he is good. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this picture of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, the perfect, sinless Lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world, to give us the gift of life. And we receive this gift by simply believing that he is Lord, that he died, he came 
to take away our sins. He was risen from the dead. And so, Lord, we thank you that your word is so plain, is so simple, is so easy to grasp. So, Lord, help us to stay here, not drift, not disobey, not depart, not get dull, not despise or defy, Lord, but just to hold on to this faith that we have in Christ. So, Lord, I pray that this word has been, been imparted to all of those who hear, and I pray that you give us faith and strength to obey your word. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. Hey, I just want to ask that uh, we will be, my family and I will be traveling to the Virgin Islands tomorrow. We spent a week there, so much needed time of rest that we're going to get. So um, just keep us in prayer as we travel. Um, and, uh, you know, all the COVID restrictions and all those things that we still have to deal with. So just keep us in that. I'm going to look forward to getting the time of refreshment and coming back. And I'm looking forward to, especially on Sunday, when we enter into this new book, uh, probably Romans. So I'll see you guys when we get back. God bless. Stop the Lord. Oh. 